Great. All right, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we have Sarah Brinkman with us. She is with Stratus Health um, as part of the Rural Quality Improvement Technical Assistance Team. Um, we have Robin Carlson speak often here in the state and Sarah is one of uh, Robin's colleagues. I know we have a smaller group today than anticipated. Um, thank you to those who are joining us and we completely understand for those folks who are not able to make it today. We are recording this session and it will be posted to our YouTube channel um, shortly. Um, as always, we wanna make these as interactive as possible. So Sarah is gonna be go over, going over some basics, some resources that are out there available to us, but also we wanna hear from you. What are things that you have implemented in the past that worked really well in terms of improvement? And what are things that maybe didn't work as well? Or um, I know taking on a new quality improvement project at the moment is probably not the, um, you're slammed with everything else, but what are some things that you've been thinking of that you're wanting to work on? And with that, um, again, small group, so feel free to blurt out your questions or ideas or chat or put them in the chat. I'll be manning that as well. So thank you guys. And Sarah, I will turn it over to you. Excellent. Thanks so much, Laura. Yes. And as Laura mentioned, please do um, inter intercede here. Oh, I turned on captioning without meaning to. Um, please do uh, ask questions, you know, challenge me on something. It, this is for you. And the more interactive you all are, the more you're going to get out of it. So um, I'm definitely an informal presenter and appreciate being able to have interaction with you all. So as Laura said, my name is Sarah, and I um, am here to present to you some quality improvement basics information. And I'm going to just give you a little bit of an overview of who I am and where I'm from. So I work at Stratus Health, which is an independent nonprofit. We're located in the Twin Cities metro area in Minnesota. And we work uh, with healthcare providers across the continuum of care on quality and patient safety related topics. We have a particularly long history of working with rural providers in critical access hospitals and the, and the FLEX program. And we, I'm here today in our capacity as the Rural Quality Improvement Technical Assistance Center, which is a cooperative agreement that we have with the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. Uh, and through that um, arrangement, we work with FORHP's uh, quality beneficiaries, so the state flux programs, the critical access hospitals, the state flux program support, and others that are funded through FORHP on quality reporting and improvement related initiatives. So specifically, you are probably familiar with us in our capacity to support MBQIP. Um, Today, our objectives, we're going to discuss the basic premise and importance of quality improvement, pretty high level. And then we're going to explore uh, the publicly available Stratus Health QI Basics course. I want to walk you through what the course has to offer and then specifically dive into a kind of high level Cliff Notes version of one of the modules that focuses on the model for improvement and the plan, do, study, act process, as well as some of the tools that are available to support those QI methods. Sorry, I've got kids at home. One of them just came in and then shut the door. Um, so please do interrupt, ask questions, chat in, whatever um, whatever direction we take this that's most useful to you is what's most intriguing to me. So we'll start with what is quality improvement. So here you can see a representation of what we're trying to accomplish with quality improvement. What we're really doing are trying to identify opportunities for improvement where there's a gap between what we know from research and identified best practices and how we actually deliver care. In healthcare, we're continually learning new and better ways to improve health, the health of populations and the delivery of care to individuals. Um, but there's almost always a gap or delay in translating that knowledge into practice and closing that gap is the role of quality improvement. This diagram shows you at the the fact that the gap will be less or narrow, narrow towards the bottom, where sometimes more rapid or simple changes to our processes and practices can lead to the needed change. And towards the top, we see larger differences in how we practice and improve healthcare, and the need for change and application of quality improvement is more significant. So, um, for example, only 50% of hospital patients currently receive appropriate care for severe sepsis and septic shock. That represents a wide gap between what we know and how we practice. So we have a pretty significant um, undertaking to make that happen. Whereas towards the bottom, it could be a pretty simple process um, that once implemented is, 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 you know, kind of fixes the issue. So an example there might be 
Um, barcode scanning. So implementing barcode scanning is a is a top gap issue, right? Once you've implemented barcode scanning, if there's one medication that's falling out, once you have that process in place, if there's one medication that for some reason wasn't following that process or something wasn't flagged appropriately, fixing that one medication might be a small gap process because you already have the underlying um, framework in mind to in place to be able to support an improvement in that area. So we really think of quality improvement as being that bridge between the gap of what we know and what we do. With regards to the foundations of quality improvement, we think of it as having four um, kind of main pillars, that it's customer and patient focused, that it's process oriented, that it's a team effort, and that it's data driven. So quality improvement should always be customer focused. And that frequently means that our patients, um, that can frequently mean our patients, but the customer might also be another person or group of people who are either internal or external to the organization. So you may have customers internally if you are if you have your lab department, their internal customers might be the nursing unit or the physicians or whoever is taking care of patients um, directly. If, if you are the dietary or EDS or things like that, you can think of internal customers as well as patients and then external customers maybe being other partners um, or healthcare providers that you're working with in the community. So when we think about having a customer or patient focus, we, we like to encourage um, thinking about this kind of more from that marketing perspective, and maybe it hasn't traditionally been the way that healthcare is thought about, but think about what it takes to really delight your customers, delighting in the sense of providing the highest possible value that the process can deliver. And think about the quality improvement definition, which is to provide quality healthcare that meets or exceeds expectations. That's the definition of quality healthcare. We want to meet or exceed expectations. So we can think about how we can um, work with our patients and our coworkers, our internal and external partners, um, patient, or customers, excuse me, to be able to do that. Our work is ultimately a series of tasks. And when they're strung all together, they result in a process or a series of steps or actions that are designed to yield a desired result or an outcome. So healthcare is really process oriented. Um, and so quality improvement helps us to step back and determine where are missteps that occur and correct them if there are issues with a process. When we have a well-defined process and understand how each step of the process impacts quality, the result is a reduction in process variation. So what we want is for patients to receive that high quality consistently. Uh, we want every we want all patients to be able to receive that highest quality care consistently. And having a process orientation helps us to figure out what the gaps and opportunities are for improving our quality and also ensures um, reduction of variation in how we're providing providing that care. Quality improvement is definitely truly a team effort that requires participation from all of the process stakeholders. Um, and in one of the modules, which we'll review um, high level shortly, teams and facilitation, you will have the opportunity to learn more about some of the particular roles that contribute to quality improvement efforts and are needed to fulfill certain activities on a quality improvement team. Uh, we There's definitely a need for strong leadership roles for guiding and managing team efforts, but we also need subject matter experts to understand the step-by-step -step details of the process we're trying to improve. Sometimes that might be clinical experts and sometimes that might be the frontline staff who are implementing and actually carrying out the work. Um, and we'll talk about the difference between what we say we're doing and what we're actually doing. So if you think of quality as being the gap between what we know and what we do, there's also often a gap between what we say we do and what we actually do. And having those folks that are on the front lines and are actually responsible for implementing our processes is an essential part of being able to drive improvement. And finally, when we think about um, when we think about quality, it has to be data driven. You can't improve what you can't measure. We need data to help us understand what our improvement focus areas should be, what should we be spending our time and energy on, what our biggest opportunities are, what our biggest risks are. Uh, we also need data to show us if we're, if we're trying something, is it working? We don't want to simply be throwing spaghetti noodles against the wall. We want to be meaningfully tracking on what we're doing to try to drive improvement on a particular issue. and then. Um, and then tracking and monitoring that over time to identify if there are tweaks that need to be made, if it's being successful, if we need to abandon it altogether. And we're going to talk about the PDSA model and how that really offers us a framework for having a data-driven quality improvement um, approach. So 
why is making quality improvement so challenging? I think the concept of quality improvement is pretty easy to wrap our heads around, but the actual implementation can be challenging. Generally, it's because we're busy with our daily routine and we don't have time necessarily to step back and analyzing how we're doing our work and identify gaps and thoughtfully make improvements. That's not to, not to um, downplay the fires that are being put out every day. And particularly right now in the time of COVID and the immense strain that's being put on our healthcare system, it's understandable that you, you have to take it, you have to take things as they come. What quality improvement offers us, if it's implemented at an organizational cultural level, is some tools to be able to assist in that effort rather than extra work to be done in addition to our efforts. So we think of being too busy to sharpen the ax is kind of the adage that we often reference at Stratus Health. Sometimes in clinical care, we can get too busy doing the day-to-day -day thing to actually take a step back and realize that if we took took some time to implement some efficiency and improvements into our processes, it would save us time and energy and result in better outcomes on the back end. When we're too busy doing the thing that isn't going well, it's hard to take time out to actually improve it so that it goes better. So making sure that quality improvement is really baked into the way that we do our work is a huge way, huge um, and very important in terms of being resilient and having that agility to react when something like COVID comes at us. And no one's ever had anything like COVID come at us before, right? But if we have if we have that quality improvement uh, culture baked in, then it's a lot easier for us to adapt when those things are thrown our way. And when I say resilient, I don't mean resilience in terms of individual resiliency and kind of combating burnout, which is important. But I mean, is the organization resilient in terms of being agile? Are they able to adapt quickly to the issues that they're facing and able to utilize that common quality improvement model or framework that your organization has adopted in different circumstances? So what often happens is on, uh, is on the right-hand side. You pick anything to work on, you think of an option, you implement a solution, you hit some system barriers, and you fail. Like, not necessarily you always fail. I don't mean to be doom and gloom. Sometimes the spaghetti noodle fix, and that's great. But what we would like to see happen is that it's a more intentional process, that you prioritize the areas to improve, and that you do that as a team, that it's not just one person saying, well, this doesn't work, so we're going to, you know, we're going to change this, and you don't have the buy-in of the necessary stakeholders to make it happen, that you analyze the problem and understand the current process and the root causes of the problem. Um, and we're going to talk about some tools to be able to assist with that, that you're measuring your current performance against your goals and understand what your progress is. You choose an option to implement. So you're not just trying 15 different things. This isn't research. You don't have to have a control group and a variable group, but it is meant to be slightly scientific enough that you can tell you didn't implement five things at one time and you're not sure which one you can attribute your improvement to. You want to be thoughtful about choosing an option to implement and doing it on a small enough scale that you can measure whether or not it was impactful and make tweaks to it before you do a broad scale uh, rollout of that intervention. And again, that's baked into the PDSA model. You implement and you test your changes and then you evaluate your results and decide what to do next. Any questions at all about the, like why quality improvement? What are we talking about when we talk about quality improvement? or any comments related to any of that content? I'm not seeing anything in the chat yet. Okay, great. So next I wanna just give you an overview of the Stratus Health QI Basics course. So this is a course made up of 11 didactic modules. There's one overview module and then 11 didactic modules. All of them include video, slides, and transcripts. Um, they can be completed in sequence or standalone, so depending on what your interest is, and all of them include references to templates and tools. The templates and tools are provided in Word or Excel documents, so they're easily um, modifiable to meet the needs of your organization if you want to brand them, if you want to change the layout, whatever that might be. We've also created a facilitator guide and a sample syllabus that you can use, so if you have a group of people at your organization and you want to walk through the course together, we've given you some tools to be able to kind of organize um, your approach to that. And so what I wanna do now is actually share uh, what that overview looks like. So you should be seeing um, our Stratus Health website and the Quality Improvement Basics course on your screen. I just wanna give you an overview. I know for me, 
sometimes people share, talk about resources and I'm like, oh, that sounds great. And then I get out to the website and I'm like, oh, I don't know what I'm looking for and I can't find it. And it's a little bit cumbersome. So just a quick overview. The quality improvement basics, and I will share the, the link in the chat here too. Um, the way that it's laid out, the facilitator guide and the sample course syllabus are provided right at the top of the page as hyperlinks. And they're available, again, for those that are interested in convening some sort of peer sharing to complete the course together. Then it's broken down into modules, and each of the modules are these high-level headers here. So there's a, an overview that you can watch if you're interested in just learning more about what's included. We're going to talk about it today, so we're kind of covering that overview live. But if you want to share it with others, that overview is available. Then we get into quality improvement foundational concepts, team concepts, communication and facilitation, change management basics, change management models and tools. We're gonna spend some time today talking about the model for improvement in PDSA. We have a couple of uh, modules related to process mapping, general process mapping, kind of 101, and then the swim lane process mapping for supporting partnerships and engagement. Data basics and data collection, data analysis and data display methods, and then uh, pulling it all together. So for each of these modules, there is a video and there that will tell you in the parenthetical afterwards how long the video is. One of them, a couple of them are around the 30 minute mark. Most of them are shorter than 30 minutes. The final module is a bit longer because it's a pull it all together module. And we tried to break them up in terms of the facilitator guide and the sample course syllabus to, to make them um, manageable week by week as you're watching them, you know, how much content can someone really take in at a time. There's always a, a slide deck provided and a transcript. And then on this, in this box on the right hand side, you'll see our quality improvement templates and tools. All of these templates and tools link back to one of the modules. So for example, the quality improvement foundational concept in that presentation, we talk about the PIC prioritization matrix, and that's provided here in the quality improvement templates and tools, which are listed in alphabetical order. So you can either access the tools based on your interests, they're on the right-hand side in alphabetical order, or as you're going through the course and you get to team concepts and you want to see the work plan, they're linked to the to the module in which they're covered. Any questions at all about how the course is laid out? Okay. So, oh, now I need to switch again. Okay, so I just wanna real quickly um, review again. So this is our little icon that goes along with the QI basics modules. You can see in the center, we have the foundational concepts and the model for improvement in PDSA. Those are really central to the concepts that we built the course around. Um, foundational concepts is at the beginning. The model for improvement in PDSA is in the middle of the, of the modules if you're doing them in order. And then around the outside, you'll see each of the other modules represented as kind of concepts that support the model for improvement in PDSA and those foundational concepts. As with most things in life, quality improvement is not linear. So when we talk about the model for improvement in PDSA today, we're gonna talk about identifying what you wanna measure. Well, that's gonna be really important if you're not familiar with that concept to review the data basics and data collection course so you might complete the model for improvement in PDSA course first, that module, and then come back and think, okay, well, in order to do that, I need, I need a refresher on data basics and data collection. So I'm gonna go watch that module. So it's all iterative and it doesn't necessarily flow in my type A brain the way I would like to from, le you know, from left to right or from top to bottom. It is this, this circle concept that we came up with for an infographic is really meant to help portray the fact that it is cyclical and you might skip steps in some cases, or you might skip modules in some cases. So, you know, you can view it that way. Again, the, the modules are, are created in such a way that they can be completed in sequence or they can stand alone. So now I wanna jump into a little bit of an overview of the model for improvement in PDSA. So this is kind of a, a Cliff Notes version of the longer module that is provided as part of the QI basic course. So the model for improvement comes from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, IHI, and I would love if folks would chat in. Um, are you, a yes or no, are you familiar with the model for improvement would be the first question. So yes, I'm familiar with the model for improvement or no, I'm not. And then 
are you familiar with PDSA or how comfortable are you with PDSA? My guess is most of you have probably heard of PDSA, but how comfortable are you with the concept? So if folks could chat that in, that will just help us get kind of a pulse and figure out where we want to focus our time today. I don't want to spend time on a lot of basic content if what would really be more helpful is more of a discussion between you all as to what your level of um, familiarity and comfort is with these concepts. So please go ahead and answer while I kind of jump in. So the model for improvement is based on the premise that you should be answering these three primary questions when you're getting ready to work on a quality improvement initiative. What are we trying to accomplish? How will we know that change is an improvement? And what change can we make that will result in improvement? We're going to jump into each of these um, as we go along. So first, what are we trying to accomplish? I really view this as an important step in the process to help you answer the why. What is it that you're trying to accomplish and why are you trying to accomplish it? This is part of your prioritization in my mind. Um, so you can simplify this and just truly state, we want to reduce cotties. We want to reduce the number of catheter-associated urinary tract infections in our facility. Um, that could be your answer to this question. If you wanted to be make it more compelling and have it be um, clear to a broader audience, I would go a step further and address the why. Why do you want to reduce cotties? Why is that important? What are all of the reasons why you would want to reduce cotties? Obviously, there's the impact to the patient. Um, what are the potential for um, for you know unnecessary antibiotics? What's the financial cost to the organization? What's the patient's experience like if they, if they have a CADI? There's a lot of reasons why you want to reduce CADIs, and that compelling reason of why might be different to different folks. So if you're thinking about the audience um, down the road as to why, you, why you've why uh, you um, taken on a particular topic, I think addressing the why in this first question is an important step. And once you've figured out what it is you want to work on and why you want to work on it, then you want to set a goal or aim. And that goal or aim should be SMART. So for those of you who aren't familiar, SMART stands for Specific, Measurable, Achievable, Relevant, and Timely. So specific means what are we trying to accomplish? You want to really narrow the description of your work to focus on the specifics. Measurable, um, as, a quali as quality improvement is data-driven, how can you quantify and measure the goal and, and the change that you are seeking? How can you measure that change? Is it achievable? Can you envision yourself actually accomplishing the goal? Is the goal with our means given the time, within the mean, your means given your time, resources, and budget? So for example, most of you probably um, do HCAP patient experience surveys. I would not say that 100% satisfaction across the board is achievable. It's, a, it's patient perspective that, that's coming into play. It's human nature. So for that type of a measure, 100% isn't achievable. On the other hand, if you're reporting your emergency department transfer communication measures, 100% is absolutely achievable. And we've seen time and time again that hospitals consistently are able to reach 100% for their EDTCL composite. So really knowing what it is you're trying to measure and what's achievable, setting goals and stretch goals is very important, but you don't wanna set unattainable goals. Otherwise it's gonna be very demoralizing to the folks that are working on that improvement effort. Is it relevant? So achieving the goal should fit in your organization's mission and strategy. How does the work that you're doing here align overall with what's going on at the organization? If you don't deliver babies at your organization, something related to reducing the number of cesarean sections is not very relevant to your facility, right? That's, a, that's an obvious one. But when you're thinking about prioritizing your efforts, how, how are you thinking about the relevance of this particular um, topic? And is the, is the measurement that you are using to determine whether or not you're successful relevant to the topic as well? And then it needs to be timely. You'll want to put a date on a calendar and set a deadline for achieving the goals or at least for, for taking stock of where you're at and then determining what happens next. So you can set some major milestones as part of your goal rather than a single date. You could say a month from now, we're going to check and see if intervention A works. And if intervention A is working, then we're going to add on intervention B or whatever that timeline might look like. But you don't just want to set a goal and just have it be wide open. You want to have some milestones along the way that are helping keeping you keep you on the on the rails. The second question is, how will we know that change is an improvement? So 
Um, the adage in quality is you can't improve what you can't measure. And what this question really underscores is the goal criteria for SMART. We have to determine a measure and set a goal that we expect to achieve um, by the change that we're implementing. So your team needs to ensure that data exists, that you have some ability to collect the data um, that will provide measurements for your proposed change. And as you determine what your measure will be, you also want to think about whether you are measuring the process itself, is the process being implemented, or a specific outcome, or both. And so what we really encourage you to think about is having process measures. So if you have put in place a process, say the barcoding process, you want barcode scanning to be in place. And one of the reasons you want to implement barcode scanning is because you want to reduce um, adverse drug events or miss like giving the wrong medication to a patient. So putting in place barcode scanning and measuring how frequently that happens. Is it happening every single time? When are where are the gaps in it happening? That's the process measure, right? So ensuring that barcode scanning is happening. The outcome measure would be how many patients received the wrong medication. Um, and so that you can have both of those measures, and we encourage we encourage um, teams to think about process and outcome measures together. You can also have some balancing measures. So how expensive is it to implement barcode scanning, for example, versus how much money is saved by not giving the wrong medication? And so again, it kind of depends on your audience. Those balancing measures can sometimes get a bit more complicated. They don't necessarily speak to the heart of why most people get into healthcare sometimes. Um, but you also don't want to be implementing improvement efforts. The other, another balancing could be time. You know, we really want to do X. We want the, the CEO of the facility to talk to every single patient before they leave so that they feel heard and we get good HCAP scores. Okay. So that's, that's a, that's a lofty goal. When you think about the, the bang for your buck, is it really from a balancing perspective worthwhile for the CEO to be spending their time meeting with each patient? Or is there a different way to go about achieving that um, high touch concept where patients really felt held and seen and heard? So those are just a couple of examples of some kind of those balancing um, measures that you could consider. We get into that a bit in a bit more detail, quantitative and qualitative measures, process and outcome and balancing measures and so on in the QI basics course data module. So data basics and data collection and data analysis and data display methods. So I encourage you to check those out. Then we have to answer the question, what change can we make that will result in an improvement? So when we think about um, about this, the first step is to clarify what the current process is and how it actually happens. And a potential tool that we encourage you to think about for this is process mapping. There are two modules in the QI basics course that cover process mapping. One is kind of a 101 version and the other is a swim lane version to kind of look at how process processes intersect um, depending on the different players that are involved. So really helpful to lay out step-by-step step what the process is um, who is involved, and then identify what the gaps are. Where are the breakdowns happening? This is what it says on paper we're doing. What does that, how does that look compared to what's actually happening on the floor? And why are those workarounds happening? Part of what's really essential when you're doing process mapping and will give you, give you the best results is if the culture is such that folks feel comfortable and safe telling the truth about what's actually happening. If the organization is highly punitive and says, if you're not following this process exactly, then, you know, there's going to, you're going to have some trouble. People aren't going to step up and say, well, here's where the gap is because it says that we do X, Y, and Z, but instead we've created this workaround because X, Y, and Z is too, too timely to take too much time. I have to walk from one end of the floor to the other to make that happen, whatever the case may be. You'll, you'll lose out on your opportunity to identify opportunities for improvement and efficiency and for that consistency of process to reduce variation if people don't feel safe speaking up as to what is actually happening. Part of that falls back to kind of having a just culture where folks feel comfortable and confident in coming forward and sharing their experience and that we, we default to assuming the best intentions that people aren't doing workarounds because they don't want to do their job, that people are doing workarounds because they're strapped for time and resources. It's more, you know, they haven't had any of the negative consequences happen by not following the process. 
So what is it that you need to actually hear from folks and create an environment where that process mapping can be a truth exercise as opposed to just reiterating what the written procedure or policy says they do? If you sit down and they say, yep, we do this exactly as it is, and you're still having gaps, then, then either that policy or process isn't working or folks aren't necessarily being truthful about how they're implementing that policy or process. Um, you want to identify the root cause. So doing a root cause analysis or RCA as it's referenced. And the potential tool for that is the five whys. So I love this example. Some of you may have heard it before. I, every time I hear it, it kind of blows my mind. So the, the concept behind the five whys is that you ask, why is something happening? And once you have the answer to that question, then you ask, why is that happening? And you keep asking and you ask at least five times or at least until you don't stop at the first why. You keep going because that further exploration is going to give you more information and help you really get to the root cause of the issue. So the example is that one of the monuments in Washington, D.C. is deteriorating. So the first question is, why is the monument deteriorating? Because harsh chemicals are frequently used to clean the monument. Okay, so the second question is, why are we using harsh chemicals? Why are those needed? And they're needed to clean off the large number of bird droppings that are on the monument. Okay, so the third question is, why are there a large number of bird droppings on the monument? Because the large population of spiders in and around the monument are a food source for the local birds. So they're swooping around. So then we say, why is there a large population of spiders in and around the monument? Uh, because vast swarms of insects, which are food for the spiders, are drawn to the monument at dusk. And then the fifth question is, why are swarms of insects drawn to the monument at dusk? Because the lighting of the monument in the evening attracts the local insects. So you can see that the solution in this case is that they came to change how the monument is illuminated in the evening in order to prevent the attraction swarming of swarming insects so that the spiders wouldn't come, so that the birds wouldn't come, so that the birds wouldn't have their droppings on the monument and they wouldn't have to use the harsh chemicals. If we had stopped at the first question of why is the monument deteriorating because harsh chemicals are frequently used to clean the monument, we might have just focused on what we're using to clean the monument instead of really getting into the detail and understanding the root cause of the issue and being able to come up with a sustainable solution that really met the, met the need. I'm gonna take a pause here because that's the, um, the, the three, questions. Um, and then I, I'm going to jump into PDSA next, but I would love for folks to weigh in, share if you have used the model for improvement before, and these three questions, any um, ideas you have about them, questions you have about them. Hi, Sarah. We've had several people comment in the chat that they are familiar with um, the PDSA cycle, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, but we had a couple of folks say, you know, I'm, I'm familiar, comfortable, but I'm always interested in learning more too. Yeah. I'm learning someone else's great. take on it. How many of you have heard that five wise example before? Maybe it's just me, but it always kind of blows my mind when I hear it. I'm always like, yeah, why, we just got to keep asking why, 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 why? Like a five-year-old. I have a seven-year-old. He asks why a lot. My six-year-old does too. It looks like we raise <laughs> their hand, but yeah, um, I'm use their methods, I guess. <laughs> yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, now we'll jump into um, the PDSA model, and then I'm going to pull up a couple of tools that are available to support you in your efforts as well. So when we look at PDSA, um, what we're what we're talking about is plan, do, study, act. So plan is what exactly are we going to do and what exactly are we going to measure so what is it that that really is hearkening back to the first question um, from the from the three questions for the model for improvement um and what what you really want to think about is again how will you know that the change is an improvement what change can you make that will result in an improvement you can start by asking some more nuanced questions that will lead you to define the details of your planning step. What change are you testing? How, what do you predict will happen and why? So some good old middle school science. What's your hypothesis? Why do you think that will happen? What are you anticipating will happen as a result of implementing this change? If you do X, we expect that it will result in Y. 
Um, you'll also address who is going to be involved in the PDSA. For example, one staff member or customer or patient, one time or one shift or one day. When you're thinking about these small tests of change, you don't want to come up with an idea and implement it whole hog across the entire organization right away. You want to do, again, small tests of change so that you can meaningfully measure the implementation and, and the change that, that resulted from that implementation. Um, when and where are you going to be testing? How long will it take to implement? What resources are going to be needed? What data are you going to be collecting? This plan phase is really the foundation to be able to drive forward the, the, the doing of the work. Um, so when you're done with your planning portion of the PDSA, you'll be answering the what, when, who, why, where, and how um, that really inform your plan. And I'm going to pull up an example of a template that you can use after we go through this full slide. Then you get to do. So when you are in your do phase, you're carrying out the test as you defined it in your plan. So um, you're you're really um, you're going to be looking at collecting some baseline data um, and then collecting your actual performance data as you go. You'll be determining how frequently you're going to collect that data and then kind of just capturing what's happening as you're implementing. So kind of, I kind of think of it as like a little diary of sorts or journal. Like, OK, we said we were going to do this. Here's what happened today. Here's what happened today. Like if if it went as planned, great. Just check the box. If something had to be tweaked, why did it have to be tweaked? What tweaks did you make so that at the end of the of the test of change, you can go back and see that all? You might be implementing a PDSA over a month period, and you're not going to remember on day 30 what happened on day one. So kind of documenting as you go what happened, what what obstacles came up, what hiccups came up, and figuring, pardon me, figuring out how to go about addressing those as you go and documenting those observations and any problems or unexpected findings. Um, both you want to be collecting, again, both quantitative and qualitative data. If you have the ability to get staff feedback about the workflow, that's really helpful and important because again, you're testing this with a small group, a kind of pilot, and then you wanna be able potentially, if it, if it works, you wanna expand it. So you wanna get feedback from the folks who are involved in it from the very beginning to understand, okay, what were the hiccups in implementation? How could we smooth out this process if we do end up doing this with a larger group um, down the road? So that qualitative feedback is really important, especially when you're thinking about scaling your improvement efforts. Um, and when you're thinking about culture change and how your organization is adapting to change. Um, you're going to be collecting your data um, and having a, a baseline set as well as your performance data will enable you to make the, those comparisons to evaluate if the changes that you've resulted have um, or changes you've implemented have resulted in the expected improvement. Um, and then based on what you learn, you're going to move into the study phase. So you're going to look at what were the actual results. Here's where we were when we started. Here's what we did. Here's where we are when we ended. Did we achieve what we set out to achieve? If we missed the mark by how much? Was it negligible and we feel like we could overcome that? Did we actually, you know, did we actually revert and we're not performing as well as we were before? Did we improve significantly? Are we pretty stagnant? What happened? Um, and then again, looking at that in terms of your balance, your balancing um, measures and your process measures, your outcome measures are important. If you implemented a process and your process measures tell you that only 5% of the time the process was followed, then your outcome measures aren't going to mean much to you, right, in terms of the, the intervention that you implemented. So really taking all of those pieces together during that study phase and looking at what are the results. And then based on what you learn from your PDSA test, you're going to categorize your actions as either adapt, adopt, or abandon with regard to the changes and improvements you tested. So adapt means you modify the changes and you repeat the PDSA cycle. So it works, but here's this thing we want to tweak and we're going to do it again. Adopt means that you're going to consider expanding the changes to additional staff, patients, departments, units. Um, and when we think about ad adopting, we encourage, and the IHI, um, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, encourages thinking about using the rule of five for spread further spreading your successful changes. So if you started with one shift, think about, you know, one, one nurse on one shift, think about spreading it to five nurses on that shift. If you started it with, with, 
five patients, think about now spreading it to 25 patients. So don't don't just adopt it whole hog because the issue, the the implementation, the intervention that you've implemented could look different depending on who's doing it, where they're doing it, when they're doing it, how they're doing it. So you really want to be thoughtful about the rollout so that in each step along the way, as you're rolling out a new intervention, you're doing that PDSA cycle and gathering that information during the do phase to understand what the specific nuances are for the department, the individuals, the patient population um, that are that are being um, impacted by the implementation and in, in the adoption phase. Or you want to abandon. And when I say abandon, it doesn't mean that you give up on trying to improve the item that you identified you needed to improve, but it means that you change your approach entirely. So you just scrap the plan that you had as opposed to adapt, where you're just going to make some modifications to the plan that you made and abandon, you just scrap the plan and you start fresh and you say, okay, that didn't work. Let's try something new. Any questions about the PDSA model? I'm going to share with you a tool. So first, I'm going to go back and share with you. This is a, um, a worksheet that is available through the um, QI Basics module for the five whys. It's pretty straightforward. Um, the five whys, again, is, is you know really just um, asking the question over and over again. But this is the basic layout of each of the tools that we've developed. So they're in a Word template. Again, you can take our branding off of it. You can put your branding on it. We just want to get the information out. That's totally fine. If you can if you can attribute it to us in some way, that's wonderful. But if it's for internal use, it's not necessary. So in each of these resources, there's um, a very basic statement at the top to tell you what it is, an introduction, and then a how to use. So this is for the five whys. We suggest that your team should complete the tool. This shouldn't be one person. This should be a team exercise. You want to have a very clear and specific problem statement, and then you want the team facilitator to ask why the problem happened and record the team's response. Um, ask them to consider if this, um, if the most recent team response were corrected, is it likely that the problem would recur? So if, if this issue that we've identified at this level were, were corrected, are we done? Or is the problem going to continue to, to move on? And that's how you know that you need to ask the next why. If the answer provided is a contributing factor to the problem, the team keeps asking why until there's agreement that the root cause has been identified and that if corrected, that the problem would not recur. Um, it often takes three to five times of asking why, but it can take more than five. So keep going until you feel the team feels that they've identified the root, the root cause. So there's a blank um, worksheet here for you to be able to utilize for capturing that information. And then there's an example. Um, and this in this example, they're looking at improving a clinic's ability to properly identify and diagnose hypertensive patients. So the question is, why isn't their hypertension process working to produce an optimal result or high performance on, on this particular measure? Um, and the answer was, we don't have regular training as well as policies and procedures. Would that alone fix it? They didn't think so. So why, why don't we have consistency around how we document and implement policies and procedures? because we have a culture of letting all providers and pra practice independently, and they instruct the nurses and medical assistants to adapt their individual practice approaches. Why is that? Because the clinical manager doesn't have the time or attention to create these policies and procedures and have clinicians confirm and utilize them. So the root causes are that the blood pressures may not be documented correctly in the EHR because there may be inconsistencies in how BP is documented from clinician to clinician, and um, you need to you know, address that, that culture issue. Often when we do this root cause analysis, analysis, what we get down to is the culture. It's not that the policy or procedure doesn't exist, it's that it's not being followed. So what is it that's causing those workarounds or those variations in how things are applied? This PDSA worksheet that we've developed um, lays out, again, you have an introduction, you have a how to use kind of instruction guide, and then I'm just going to scroll down here too. So we have the three questions for the model for improvement are included. Um, why are, well, what are we trying to, you know, what are we trying to accomplish? How will we know that change is an improvement? What change can we make that will result in an improvement? You're going to lay out your plan. So you're going to describe your test of change, who's responsible, when they're going to do it, where they're going to do it, and any other notes. Um, within the plan, you're also going to define what exactly are you going to measure for your test of change? So do you have, what's your measure? 
What's your baseline? What's your prediction or your hypothesis? And then eventually, what is your outcome and result can be populated here so you can compare. And again, when you think about what exactly are we going to measure, you're probably likely going to have process measures, outcome measures, possibly balancing measures. You're going to have more than one measure that you're looking at most likely within a PDSA cycle. Um, for do, you're going to go about implementing your test of change and you're going to just take notes as you go along. Were things, did things go as planned? What deviations did you come up against? What were surprises or challenges that you faced? Once you ha are done with the implementation and you're ready to analyze your results, that's when you get to the study section. So that's where you're going to look at the results from your quantitative and your qualitative measures. You're going to summarize and reflect on what you learned, and that will help determine if you what you want to do in your action step. Are you going to adapt, adopt, or abandon? And then what modification to the plan are you going to make in the next cycle? So if you're adapting, what is the change that's made, being made? If you're adopting, where are you going to roll this out next? And then you start over again. In all of our templates, we have an example. So just like we walked through the example for the five whys, there's an example here of um, again, with a hypertension example built in, how um, a P, what a PDSA um, plan, do study, act cycle would look like with regards to improving um, the um, proper identity, identification and diagnosis of hypertension in patients based on their blood pressures. Any questions about that? Oops, sorry about that. I'm gonna do the switch here. Okay, so last but not least, I've got some discussion questions for us. And then I also have some just additional resources to share with you all, but I'm interested to know as you think about previous quality projects you've participated in, did they utilize the PDSA model? And if not, how could the PDSA model have been applied? And then what obstacles or barriers, either real or perceived, do you think stand in the way of utilizing PDSA for your quality projects? So this is where I'm really looking for your interaction and engagement. Love to have some discussion and hear what your um, pain points are with this model. Most of you said that you're familiar with it. Um, why does or doesn't it work? What, what have you learned in your quality improvement journey? Um, everyone, you can unmute yourselves. Um, you have that control. And or if you'd just like to type in the chat, I, I'm happy to read them out loud. Okay. While you're all thinking on that, we can come back to it. I will just quickly go through a couple of additional resources to share with you. Um, so I think that you all are familiar with MBQIP Monthly, which is our newsletter. We send that out on a monthly basis, as the name suggests, to the state flex programs, and they then share it with their um, critical access hospitals. Uh, it comes out typically the first Wednesday or Thursday of the month, so it will either be coming today or tomorrow to the flex coordinators, and then they'll turn around and share it with you. So Laura will be sharing it with you. It always includes a cause can or highlight article, a data article, some tips and um, reporting tips and tricks from our um, quality reporting specialist, Robin, and then timely tools and resources. We also want to call your attention and have um, in the last couple years of MBQEP Monthly been calling attention to a resource that we've developed called Quality Time Sharing Pi. So this is a podcast that has been developed uh, with contributions from our quality improvement mentors. So uh, we are just going through um, the selection process for our second round of quality improvement mentors. They served two year a two-year term. They are from, they are just like all of you. They're experts that are doing the work in the field. They're nominated by their state flex programs and then apply to be a part of the project. And then we select from those that apply. Um, and they get together on about a quarterly basis, a couple of them to have a discussion about a topic related to quality improvement. We record that and edit it and turn it into a podcast. Um, they're all 15 minutes or less. They're meant to be very accessible um, and be just that real-time discussion between folks in the field that are doing the work. So if you haven't checked that out yet, we encourage you to do that. There's a link in the slides to where you can find it on the Stratus Health website. You can um, Google quality time sharing PI. PI stands for Performance Improvement Experience. Or you can find it wherever you get your podcasts. 
it's on Spotify, it's on Apple, it's all all across the board. You can wherever you get podcasts, you can go ahead and register for it there and listen to the backlog of, of issues that have been created. And then finally, we have our quality improvement implementation guide and toolkit for cause. This is a bit of a different format than the QI basics course. This takes on more of a guide style format, and it's really focused on MBQIP. The QI basics course does not reference MBQIP at all, but it was built with rural providers in mind. So recognizing that oftentimes you have um, a lot of people wearing multiple hats and things of that nature with regards to your quality improvement efforts. Whereas this implementation guide and toolkit is specifically for critical access hospitals and talks about MBQIP directly. But similar to the QI Basics course, all of the tools that are offered in templates are offered in a format that make it so that you can make it your own. You can edit them, um, you can change them, you can brand them, you can do whatever you like with them. One of the resources that's part of this implementation guide and toolkit that I like to call attention to are the QI measure summaries. So this goes through all of the core MBQIP measures and provides best practices and suggested strategies for improving your outcomes in those measures. So if you are working on a particular MBQIP measure and kind of hitting a roadblock in terms of being able to improve any further, some suggested strategies and best practices can be found within that, within that toolkit. And that's what I have for you today. So I'm gonna stop sharing and see if there's any comments or questions. Uh, thank you, Sarah. We did have a comment. I've used these process improvement tools in various clinics and I found them successful. And Sarah, I don't know if I mentioned early on, but we sent this um, registration link to all rural health clinics and um, critical access hospitals. Oh, excellent. Yeah. So I know um, some of your rural health clinics are going to be participating in a QI project this coming year. And um, we are asking the state to leverage the PDSA process that we've outlined here. Um, to help us track at a national level what's happening at the state level. And then some of the states are then pushing that same process out to their participants and asking them to utilize it. So we kind of end up with a water flow, um, with, a, with a waterfall, seeing how you know it flows from the national down to the state, down to the direct practice, and then back up to what's happening at the direct practice facility level uh, and rolling back up. So we're really interested to see how that works and excited to have some of your rural health clinics on board. All right. Does anyone have any questions for Sarah or comments or just a story? We love stories um, yeah. of experiences. We, Sarah, we hosted a cohort. It's been a few years now, um, a cohort of cause to look at um, quality improvement and everyone gets to kind of pick their own measure. But it was super interesting hearing some of the just quick fixes that people could find, um, especially around time measurements, mm -hmm. um, just super quick, easy fixes. And so it was, it was a really good experience, but then after that, so many things have happened since then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's been a strange couple of years. Yeah. Those quick fixes. Um, when we, when you, if you watch the modules, I can't remember which module it's in, but we talk about that. And that, you know, when we, when we look at the, the gap between what we know and what we do and that QI bridges that gap, Finding those quick fixes is a big way to boost morale and build confidence to be able to bridge those bigger fixes that take more time and intention and really break people out of the notion of this is the way we've always done it. So we're going to keep doing it this way, which sometimes can be a big obstacle to improvement. So finding those quick fixes. Um, one of the other big tips and tricks that we suggest is getting the squeaky wheel on board. So if you know the naysayer who is never interested in any quality improvement efforts, if you can get them on board from the beginning and they have buy-in to the process that's determined and identified, it's going to go a long way towards, um, towards being able to drive that improvement effort overall and get everybody moving in the right direction. Um, another thing that was mentioned during that cohort was also find some of the newest people who aren't, this is why we've always done it, that might ask, yeah. well, why do we do it this way? Yep, yep, absolutely. That's a great call out. All right, well, does anyone have a question or comment or? I'm sorry, this was a lot of me talking and you. <laughs> I hope that it was useful and welcome your thoughts. If you have feedback, you can feel free to send it to Laura and she'll pass it on to me as well. Yes. All right. Well, thank you guys for your time. If you have any questions as you leave here today, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. Sarah has already sent me her slides and we will get those out as soon as we get this recording posted. Um, so with that said, 
thank you for your time. And if there's anything we can do to help you, please um, let us know. And thank you, Sarah, for talking to us. Thanks for having me. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye, everyone.